My name is Mark McGuinness, and this is the 21st Century Creative, the podcast that helps you thrive as a creative professional amid the demands, the distractions, and the opportunities of the 21st century. Welcome to episode five of the creative disruption season of the 21st Century Creative, where we are hearing stories from creatives around the world who came up with a creative response to the challenges of the pandemic. Today, we're going to look at one of the biggest challenges for many people during lockdown, whether or not they were creatives, and that is parenting. Even before the pandemic, balancing childcare and creative work was a challenge for many creative professionals because, of course, they are both things that require undivided attention. It's pretty well impossible to deal with both of them at once. Then along came lockdown and the challenge got even harder. And it was compounded by the expectations in a lot of quarters that, as well as doing our own work, we would be homeschooling our children as well. All of which meant that Kay Locke Culp found her experience and her expertise in big demand. Kay is a coach and podcaster with years of experience of helping parents to be better parents and also to take better care of themselves. She is also a creative, and she has many years' experience of homeschooling her own children, which put her in the perfect position to help creatives and other parents cope with the challenges of the last couple of years. I've known Kay online for years, so when I realised how important it was to cover parenting in the creative disruption season, she came to mind as the obvious person to ask. I'm pleased to say she said yes. So stay tuned for Kay's compassion and wisdom on how to stay creative as a parent. And yes, that title does have a double meaning, even during lockdown. So back in season five of the podcast, I told you I had a new business partner, Mammy who also happens to be my wife. And we are the joint owners of the 21st Century Creative Limited. And she is a co-producer of this podcast. And I thought it would be nice to introduce you to her today. Mammy, I would say welcome to the show. But you've been here all along, haven't you? Yes, I've been here in the background. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about your work. Yes, uh, I'm a writer, I've been a journalist and editor for a long time, first in Japan and in England for the last 19 years. And now I'm writing a book and I'm also a coach. I started coaching nearly three years ago. So what's the book about? I'm writing a book about English culture, people, food and so on. I try to tell my readers how to enjoy life and how to be yourself, which I found through my experience in England. And what made you want to be a coach as well as a writer? Um, The reason why I want to be a coach is that I'd like to encourage and empower people. As an editor, I met so many amazing people who are top performers and high achievers. They like to talk to me even after our work finished. So sometimes we spend time together and I just listen to their life, work, difficulties, problems. And usually after our conversations, they said they got energy back. Then I realized that coaching and what I've been doing as an editor are very similar. So what kind of clients do you work with? I'm working with people who want to make big changes in their lives. Professionals, entrepreneurs, social business owners, 
who believe that they can achieve what they want to and it will make a positive impact towards their family, friends and society. And I believe you have a message for the Japanese speakers in our audience. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> 日本語を話される方で、このポッドキャストを聞いてくださっている皆さん、こんにちは。コーチマミータです。えー、あなたは今、人生の転換期にあって、自分の人生を変えたいと思っていますかえー、もし、そういうチャレンジをしたい、リーダー、起業家、あるいは起業や副業を目指している方、社会事業家の方がいらっしゃいましたら、ぜひ一度お話しいたしましょう。Well, I mean, obviously, I understood every single word of that. <laughs>、um, but, you know, for the benefit of anyone who's listening who isn't quite as fluent in Japanese as I am, what was that? It was an invitation to get in touch if they are interested in get, getting my help as coach. I said that if someone is listening who is a leader, entrepreneurs, or social entrepreneurs, and they want to change their lives or their business, Then they can contact me and we can talk about it. Well, thank you very much, Mami, for all your help behind the scenes, as well as for coming on the show today. And I'm sure we'll be hearing from you again before too long. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, listeners,、uh, for supporting this show. In last week's episode, I suggested that if you're serious about achieving your creative ambitions, you need to think in terms of projects, not tasks. Because if you get up every morning and ask yourself, what should I work on today? You risk making decisions based on what feels urgent right now, rather than what will make the biggest difference in the long term. But when you focus on projects rather than tasks, you shift your perspective from the daily round of tasks to bigger, more substantial works. Writing a book or a script, recording an album, creating an exhibition, producing a show, launching a company, and so on. And when you do this, you give yourself a shot, creating the game changing, career defining work that you dream of. But supposing you're like me, you typically have a list of different projects that you would love to get on with. You feel spoilt for choice and torn in several directions at once. How do you decide which of them to work on? Should you do the thing that fires you up creatively, even though you can't see any money in it? Or should you focus on a money project, even though it doesn't really inspire you? Or should you do the thing that will help to build your reputation within your creative field, even though it's not obvious what the payoff will be? Or should you do the thing that's currently working really well for you and people are encouraging you to continue with, even though you'd rather move on to something new? And it's easy to make a case for any of these options, which is why you can find yourself going round in circles, moving from one to the other, or even worse, trying to do them all at once. That's why last week I recommended you focus on one project at a time, for a few months at a time. Then you pause to evaluate your progress, and if necessary, change direction. But which project should you pick? If your creative work is separate from the work you do for a living, it's relatively easy. You're already paying your dues to society, so you can afford to give your passion projects free reign. But if you are a creative professional earning a living from your creative work, then there's always a delicate balancing act between creativity, money, passion, and professional advancement. One answer is to spend a few months on your passion project and then do a more commercial project later on, or one that will raise your professional profile. But if you get to the point where it feels like you're constantly facing a trade off between different motivations and you're feeling frustrated by this, then it's worth considering the type of project you're choosing from. Passion projects are great, and money projects can be useful. 
But they are both what I call single-faceted projects, because you have one clear motivation for each project, which means that on its own, that project is not sustainable enough or not satisfying enough to be your long-term focus. But the holy grail for creatives is discovering a multifaceted project where you don't have to choose between creativity, money, personal fulfillment, or professional success. Because all of these things are found in the same project. When something is multifaceted, like a diamond, it reveals different aspects according to which angle you look at it from. You can turn it and contemplate the different facets, but it's all the same thing. If your creative project is like a diamond, it will be valuable in different ways at once. And it will shine. In my book, Motivation for Creative People, I talk about four fundamental types of motivation that are essential for a successful and sustainable creative project. Firstly, intrinsic motivation, the love of the work for its own sake. This is the most important from a creative point of view. Secondly, extrinsic motivation, rewards for the work, such as money, fame, artistic reputation, or new opportunities. And this is most important from a sustainability point of view. Thirdly, personal motivation, expressing your individual personality, your feelings, your taste, and your point of view. And finally, social motivation, the energy you get from other people, whether through connection, collaboration, competition, or contribution to your community. A truly multifaceted project incorporates all four types of motivation. It brings you creative fulfillment, financial and other rewards, personal satisfaction, and social connection. So when you're working on a multifaceted project, there's no conflict. No, but on the other hand, holding you back. The different motivations interlock and make each other stronger, propelling you forwards. And you move forward faster on all fronts, partly because of the energy the project gives you, and also because you're saving time. You know, instead of doing different projects for different reasons, one after the other, you get all your motivations at once from a single project. For example, this podcast, The 21st Century Creative, that you are listening to right now, is a multifaceted project for me. I love making it. It's a creative outlet for me. It also brings me coaching clients and income, as well as income via the Patreon membership. And it helps to get my name out there and attract interesting opportunities. And when it comes to personal motivation, I always remember the feeling I had when I recorded my very first interview for the show. I realised it felt like I was inviting my guest into my place. You know, there are plenty of other podcasts for creatives out there, but this is my show, my place to talk about the things that matter to me and where I get to do things my way. And the best thing about the show is the way it connects me to other creators, listeners, guests, clients, Patreon members, other podcasters, and the wider creative world. So that, or rather this, is one of my multifaceted projects. How about you? Maybe you're working on a multifaceted project already, in which case, hang on to it. But if you're feeling pulled between different types of projects and you'd really love to have a multifaceted project to focus on, here's a way to get started. Write out the list of your current or potential projects, the things that you're itching to get on with, and ask yourself which of the four types of motivation it gives you. Give it one tick for each type of motivation. Intrinsic, extrinsic, personal and social. And I want to emphasise that extrinsic motivation doesn't just mean money. It could also mean building your artistic or professional reputation, growing your fame, or attracting opportunities. Okay, so when you've gone through your list, look at how many ticks 
how many facets each project has. If a project has four facets, then it's a no-brainer. Make it a priority because that is a multifaceted project. If it's got two or three, ask yourself, is there a way you can expand it to add more facets with different types of motivation? And if it just has one facet, that's fine if you really love that one thing about it. But if not, maybe it's time to retire that one and focus on other things. From my own experience and also observing coaching clients, a multifaceted project often emerges mid-career when you've tried a few different lines of work, which has given you a you know, different blend of skills and experience. And then one day things start to come together and you can see a way to create something that combines all those different elements in one. And remember, the surest sign of a multifaceted project is that it shines. If you enjoy the 21st Century Creative, then you might like to know I offer an alternative take on creativity on my other podcast, A Mouthful of Air, where I interview poets about the writing process behind their poems. Here's the poet Mimi Calvati talking about writing The Sestet, which is the second part of a sonnet, in relation to her collection Afterwardness, published by Carcanet. I think of the sestet as something essentially that has to write itself. Mm. Um, all my, if you like, authorial intention really has to be moved aside and out of sight. It just has to leave the room. Mm-hmm. And for me, I just, when you say how, you know, if you're thinking, how do you do that? I don't know how, because all I have is the knowledge or feeling in my mind that here's the sestet, it's just got to come somehow by itself. It's got to be a given rather than me constructing it. So all I can really do is try and get myself out of the way. And of course, it either works or it doesn't. And the other side of that is the willingness to throw away lots of cestets that don't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a bit like, um, you know, Picasso did that exercise where he did a line drawing of the bull and he never took the pencil off the page and he had to just get it in one. Mm-hmm. I think of writing the sestet, like you're trying to do that. You're trying to just get it in one. And it either goes or it doesn't. To keep it or ditch it, basically. You can find A Mouthful of Air on all the usual podcast platforms with a new episode every two weeks to give you a regular connection to the muse. Over the years I've been doing this podcast, I've occasionally received emails from listeners, especially in relation to productivity-focused episodes, saying, that's all very well, Mark, but what if you have kids? And what if you're the primary carer or you're a single parent? I don't know where I'm going to find the time to follow through on all these great ideas. Children are a creative blessing in so many ways. They prompt us to look at the world afresh, and it's wonderful to enter imaginary worlds with them via stories and games and movies and so on. And balancing work and childcare is difficult whatever your line of work, but it's particularly difficult when your work demands the kind of focus required for creative work. Now, this subject's already come up in several interviews, 
And I am a parent myself, so we've touched on it here and there. But I would certainly not describe myself as an expert in this field. And I'm very lucky that I have a wife, Mammy, with whom I share the parenting responsibilities. We are business partners as well as husband and wife. So we're free to arrange our work schedule to support each other and the children, as well as our clients. So I am not up against it in the way that you are if you are a single parent or if you're dealing with less flexible working arrangements. All of which means that I've been on the lookout for a parenting expert who really understands not just childcare, but also the creative mindset and the ups and downs of the creative life. So I was fortunate to meet Kay Locke Culp a while back when she interviewed me for her parenting podcast. And I got to know Kay a bit better when she joined the 21st Century Creative Members Group on Patreon. As well as being a source of wisdom on all things parenting, Kay is an artist and author herself. And as a coach, she has experience of helping creatives navigate the competing demands of parenting and work. Kay lives in Massachusetts, USA, with her husband, sons, and the family's 12 and a half year old pet chicken. Via her coaching and her podcast, Practical Intuition with Kay, she offers support for grown ups and our inner lives. She's based online at klockkolp.com. That's K-A-Y-L-O-C-K-K-O-L-P. So it was already in my mind to invite Kay onto the podcast to answer questions on the theme of how to stay creative as a parent. And And then the pandemic struck and many of us were plunged into lockdown and involuntary homeschooling. And it suddenly felt like all the reasons I had to invite Kay onto the show had multiplied and become even more urgent. So I reached out to her and asked if she'd be up for doing an interview about parenting for creatives, with a special emphasis on the acute and increasingly chronic challenges of the pandemic. And I'm delighted to say she accepted. In the course of this interview, she talks about her own experience of art and parenting and about what she learned from homeschooling her own children long before the pandemic arrived. She also shares insights based on her work helping parents who face hard choices about where to put their time and attention on a daily basis. And If you're in a situation where the children are currently taking priority over your creative career, then you may be interested to hear Kay's ideas about how to keep your creative flame alive, even if it's not on a full-time basis. In terms of the pandemic, Kay tackles the practical challenges of lockdown parenting and homeschooling, as well as sharing some insights around self-care, permission and what she calls the inner life of parents. Throughout the interview, you'll hear Kay's upbeat and resilient spirit in the face of her own health challenges, as well as parenting in general, and the pandemic in particular. The attitude that prompted one of Kay's clients to say that she helps people knock the bricks off their wings and truly fly. Hey, how did you get started on your creative path? Wow. I think I think I've been on this creative path since I was small. It, so it is winter time right now as we're recording. And um my favorite some of my favorite memories of winter time are when you could go out um and there would be like a brook, for example, or a, or a a creek or a pond or something. And just at the edges, there would be these frozen bits of water. And you could put your, you could sort of press down on them and they would make these cool crackling noises. And I always felt like I was in a dance with them. And, and I think that is really where it started for me. Um, in my, in my childhood, there was always singing and, um, uh, lots of joy and silliness and um 
you know, I, I, there have been times in my life, I think, where that's been stymied. That's been sort of like stoppered or someone has tried to put me in a box, right. Or, or tell me to stay in my lane. But, um, there's something in me that, that wants to come out. And so, um, I, I, it's funny because I've been thinking of myself recently as a creator, not necessarily as an artist or a podcaster or a writer, because mm. I'm all of those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I hope that's okay to say, like it started a long time ago for me, the, the idea of, of being creative. And then how did that translate into career choices, work choices? Yeah. Um, I think, I love this question and, and it's, I'm seeing my career choices sort of in a way that I really hadn't before. Um, I became a teacher. I, I, I wanted to become a teacher. Um, mm -hmm. but before that I was enrolled in the school of fine art at, uh, the university of Connecticut and that I spent my freshman year there, um, for photography. But when you, when you do one, obviously you do a lot of, there's a lot of other fine arts, you know, classes that you need to take and, mm -hmm electives and those sorts of things. And, um, I did really well up until I took a drawing class. Um, and in that class, I was really sort of shown that I was put into a box basically. And the box was, you are not an artist, like go away. You are not an artist. And I was like, well, you know, these aren't really my people anyway, I guess. And I, I had started working at the, oh, sorry, how, how were you getting that? Oh, <laughs> well, because the teacher would uh, hold up my work in front of the class and say, look at this lousy garbage. Look at this. Like, this is not what you, sh everybody do the opposite of this. I mean, it's, it was rough. Yeah. Whoa. I mean, that was some garbage teaching, huh? <laughs> yes, it really was. It really was. And I, it's only in, it, you know, the creativity has come out of me in other ways in my personal life. Like I'm, there's a quilt that I made years ago that's right behind me. I've been a knitter. I've made really fun and beautiful, even landscape quilts. Like I've given myself permission to do that sort of, but I've always said to myself, well, you, you know, you're just not, you're not good at drawing. You're not good at like freestyle, freeform art. And it's only in the last six months that I have invited that back into my life on and given myself permission and said, you know what, you get to define your worth. Not, not some jerk mm. from when you were 19. So, so I think it comes up because I was, I was working at this wonderful place called the University of Connecticut Child Labs. Um, and they were my people. I was like, oh, this is where I belong. And, um, I, I was especially drawn to child development, to human development, but especially child development and, um, the interaction between parents and kids, adults and kids has always been very fascinating for me. Um, and to be able to kind of take that into teaching was wonderful. For a while, I, I, uh, joyfully homeschooled our, our two sons. Um, I, I recognized that we were so lucky to be able to do that. And, um, I know that's not everybody's path. Uh, but I think even if you're not homeschooling, you, and a lot more people are these days, right, Mark? Well, <laughs> I was going to say, there's been a lot of involuntary homeschooling there, going yeah. on. In the last and couple there's of a years. lovely there's a lovely attitude that we can have about it, which is like it, it has much more to do with what's in what's what does our child need versus like what is the school system saying we should do with them. Mm -hmm. does that, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> so you went into homeschooling. Yes, and then when my oldest was eleven, I um, I I got very sick with an intestinal disorder. And the antibiotics that I took to alleviate that have since been shown to have an ingredient in them that causes things like tendon rupture, tendon scarring. And so about 10 and a half years ago now, I, um, I, I stepped into an unplanned adventure, which was uh, I lost the ability to walk more than a few steps. I needed a, a wheelchair when I left the house. Um, and the, the worst of it was I, I lost hope because I, uh, I wasn't getting messages from my environment that like something can change about this. And then mm, about eight months in, I met someone who could change it and did change it. And about 18 months after that, after I relearned how to walk and 
um, I was able to like ski, for example, again, I was able to run, I was able to sort of do all the good, fun things. Right. So that's, that's a pretty good indicator of things are moving in the right direction, huh? Yes. Yeah. And that, well, and then what happened was I, uh, the tendon problems returned in the sense they'd never really gone away, but I lost the ability to use my hands, my thumbs, my forearms with really at the beginning there for a long time, I had like 5% use of my hands. And this is where I feel like this is where the beginning of the sort of like what I'm, what I do now, where that really started, because um, a friend of mine said, okay, well, you know, you can't, you can't do the usual home things that you love to do. You're not cooking, you're not folding laundry, you're not doing any of that stuff. What can you do? You've got a lot of time. What can you do? And I started to think about like what I was good at and what I was good at was, was helping parents and children thrive together and helping parents like not be frazzled um, for, through my interactions in the, with kids in the classroom and getting to know their parents. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, well, I can do something with that. And, and um, it's a, obviously it's a much longer story than that, but that's as sort of as simplified as I can make. It. And that's really brought me to where I am now. <laughs> so tell me, and for the purposes of today's conversation, let's make now maybe late 2019, before you know what happened. So tell me about the work that you had evolved, the business that you had evolved, what life and and work were like at that point. Yes. So uh, I had a a podcast for parents of young children that um, was thriving. And um, I had, uh, from that, I had built a, an online community for parents, like a sort of behind, you know, behind people would log in and uh, there would be courses there and there were people could ask questions and, Mm -hmm. and it was very fun, but I was way too um, invested in it. So, and then, and then the pandemic happened that, 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 you know, who thing, but well, so I should say I loved my life at that point. I I did have a lot of good time with my family. I, um, I didn't work sort of like 40 hours a week. It was, it was less than that. So I was able to kind of, be active and do things that I that I really wanted to do, but I I, I wasn't living like a, a a really authentic life quite yet. And what kind of things were you helping parents with? I was helping parents with with things like like going from spanking to um, a kind of more empathy centered. Uh, the style of parenting where like a child feels really seen and cared for and, mm-hmm. and it's, it's much gentler. It's much more fun. Um, so I was, I was helping with things like that, things like potty training, which I mean, it all sort of, it's along in the same vein because we can be pretty, we can come down really hard on a kid who's just wet the bed or we can, we can help them understand that like, it's really okay. <laughs> and yeah. and we can try again tomorrow, you know? Those sorts of things, really situational, this happened, what do I do now kind of things. Okay, so really practical. Yes. Would you call it coaching, mentoring, teaching? I would probably call it a mix of coaching and teaching, yeah. Okay, all right. And so one reason I've been meaning to invite you on the show for a while, Kay, is that every so often I get an email from a listener who says to me, you know, I really loved episode so-and-so and and it's really great, Mark, but I I can't help thinking it's all very well, but what if you have kids? It's not so easy to focus. It's not so easy to block out the day. It's not so easy to be productive. It's so easy to feel that actually I'm not making any progress as, as a creative, as, as an artist. I mean, did you ever find yourself faced with that kind of question from the creatives in your community? Oh God, yes. I mean, yeah. And well, I think that was one of my favorite ways to be helpful was to help people see that like, you don't have to just twist in the wind, you know, there are things we can do here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but I, I, I really appreciate what you're saying, especially for someone who, who, you know, you'll, you'll have a day planned and then you'll get a, a call from a teacher or, you know, in 2019, right, you'd get a call from a teacher and you'd have to go you know, handle something or do something or deal with something. And like, it would wreck your whole day. Um, and you would feel like, what's the damn point? <laughs> like, what am yeah. I doing here? 
I can't, you know, you, you can get so easily interrupted. Um, and I think one of the things I was able to be helpful with was to, was people would come to believe that like what was going on with their child mattered more. I, I, you know, this is not for emergencies, right? But like on a daily basis, what was the drama that was unfolding in their child's life was much more important than their own feelings of wellness or happiness or contentment or fulfillment or joy. Mm -hmm. And like, it can just feel like such a treadmill that you can't get off of. And to help people know that, that, that they can and, and then take steps to do it is so cool. So. Okay. And even, you know, maybe without dramas, taking kids out of school, I mean, particularly when they're, they're young, they're really mm-hmm. young and they're small and they're home all the time and they want attention all the time. I know how frustrating that can be. Um, just for context, we had twins and mm. <laughs> suddenly my well-ordered productivity routine just just went out the window for a few months and it took quite a long time before we managed to, Mammy and I managed to get any kind of semblance of a, a structure back in place that, yeah. that where we each had some space. And I know from talking to clients, there's quite often one parent will end up doing more of this than another. Or obviously, the, you know, if you're a single parent, it's really hard to get relief. What kind of things do you find yourself saying to a creator who's really frustrated? You know, obviously, they love their child. The child's always going to come first in the moment because mm-hmm. that's that's nature. But, but who is feeling really down, frustrated um, about the lack of progress, the lack of focus in in terms of their own creative work in their career. What what kind of things were you saying to them? You know, it's really interesting because the way that it presented was not so much I'm experiencing this feelings of lowness sort of in my own creative career. It was really much more of like, well, I've had to put all that on hold. Uh-huh. Like I can't do that because I've yeah. got, you know, I've got all of my focus needs to be on my child. And and so many times when they would come to understand that like actually putting all your focus on the child is detrimental to both the child and to us. Um, even though that sounds really counterproductive or counterintuitive, but um, then when once they started to realize like I do not have to be organizing their lives all the time. I do not have to be. And when I say, by the way, when I say them, I I do mean me. (laughs) (laughs) I, you know, I, I not, I don't come by this work without some of my own kind of like helicopter parenting tendencies. So, um, but, but the, the realization that like your five-year-old isn't going to, um, you know, spontaneously, and this is not in every single case, but you can you can take steps to make sure that they're safe while you are doing something creative. Like you can you can take steps. You don't have to just go with their whim. In fact, it's much more dangerous to go with their whim because then they they don't have a good sense of like safety or security. Mm-hmm. So, I Julie Lithcott Hames is a really wonderful uh, writer and and uh, woman who talks about parenting and. She, she gives a TED Talk and she has said that, that basically the, the basis for that TED Talk is the kids need two things. They need love and they need to be assigned chores. <laughs> and I always oh, love okay, that. Okay, great. Maybe my kids should watch that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but seriously, I'll make sure we can get a link to that TED Talk in the show notes. We'll, yeah. we'll put it in the transcript of the interview. Okay, Kate, I'd like to back up a little bit to to what you said that actually, because it is counterintuitive, you said that putting all your attention, putting all your focus on the child and putting your own art career or any kind of career, I'm guessing, completely on hold, it isn't good for you or the child. Could you unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, okay. So the first glimmering I had of this was in a a, a book series that I read while the kids were oh, I started reading this book series probably when they were five and one or something like that. Um, And even just taking time for fiction for me was like, what? You're doing what? You're not concentrating on them because you're reading? Oh my gosh, like what a crime. Um, But I still did it. And I can remember my mom doing it and I thought, all right, I I can do it. Like this is, I've got good role modeling for this. I'll do Mm -hmm. this. And in those books, 
the, the, the you watch, uh, his name is J.W. Jackson. You watch him um, fall in love and get married on on an island right near us, near called Martha's Vineyard. And, um, and he and his wife eventually start having children and they don't stop their lives. They just, they like, if they want to go fishing, you know, and it's the tides coming in, it's 4am, they bundle their little baby up and they bring him to the water and they, and they, they, you know, and the, th- that sort of happens all over this child's life. And then they have more mm-hmm. kids. And, and I remember thinking like, boy, that must be nice. And, and um, from that sort of glimmering of like wanting to be able to do what I wanted to do and, and have my children along with me or doing what they wanted to do themselves yeah. came the idea that um, that's actually better for them. And it's better for me um, because if I am, and I'm going to use, I'm going to use a word that I, I don't mean in an accusatory sense, but the sort of micromanagement that we can do mm. in our children's lives um, what we're doing is we're giving them the message, I don't trust you to make good decisions. I don't trust you to choose something to play with hmm. um, or choose someone to play with. Uh, instead, I'm going to handle all this for you because uh, I know best. Mm-hmm. And it takes my life energy and my uh, you know, continual questioning of like what will be best for them and like how do I arrange this so that I can go to bed at night feeling like, I've not done anything to fill up my own well, you know, my own cup. And also, uh, you know, there was always a sort of vague like, but is this really what you ought to be doing for them? (laughs) I hope that makes sense. No, it does. And that phrase, you know, not not filling up my own well, my own cup, you know, it's so easy to do that, to think you're doing the right, in inverted commas, thing by giving everything to everyone else. But at a certain point, I think you need to fill your own well up, if even if you're only thinking it in terms of for them, because who are you going to be for them? Yeah, yeah. If you don't find a way to do that, exactly, exactly. And I, I so one of the joys, uh, again, pen, pre-pandemic, was um, a mom who had we had really been working together on like how is she speaking to the school? How is the school? Because like, she was getting these horrible messages from the school about her son's behavior and she she would just get so upset and derailed. And one of my favorite conversations we had was when she was like, you know what I'm going to do now is I'm going to let him be at school and I'm going to pick up my paintbrush. And I just thought, oh, so good. <laughs> so, okay. So one thing I'm hearing is is just giving yourself permission to do something for yourself. Yeah. Whether that, I'm guessing whether that's something artistic or even, you know, something else that, dare I say, may not even be work as being important. Um, (laughs) Any other kind of things that, say, somebody could do to keep an artistic... I'm thinking, you know, ways to keep a sense of that their artistic practice is continuing and that they're still building some momentum in their career. Maybe it's not going to be as as full steam ahead as it was before the kids came along, but Mm. um, what could you say around that? Uh, I would say think small is what I would say. Um, I actually, so this, this year, uh, I, each six months I do a little planning document and, um, because I've recently given myself permission to draw again, I drew a little door on it and the door is open and the label on the door says think small. And there's like magic sparkles coming out of the door and there's lots of, you know, flowers Mm -hmm. and stuff around it. And, um, for me, what that means is take a tiny step. Like if uh, I've heard it said, um, uh, KJ Delantonia, who has a wonderful podcast uh, with her friend Jessica Leahy called uh, Am Writing, hashtag Am Writing. They talk about even if you can't do anything else, open the document. Like pr- chances are good that if you open the document, you will find a little time to, to mm. you know, write a sentence or something like that. Um, but even if you don't, at least you opened the document. And, and I have found that, like 10 minutes of drawing, uh, 10 minutes of writing, five minutes of, of those things, a sentence, like to keep yourself, we, I think we have this idea that like we have to carve out, we, we need a, a week, you know, in a castle where we're completely isolated and by ourselves. And of course, I mean, I totally have that fantasy, <laughs> but, <laughs> but in, the, in yeah. a daily sort of situation, that's not, you know, that's not the reality. What is it, what is in our control? It is to 
it is to take an action, to, even if it's a tiny action, and and just make a stroke of drawing on. I once did a pastel painting, and I gave myself permission because it was it felt more like coloring than it did like freeform drawing. But anyway, it took me like two years because I it was it was when my hands were not as good as they are now, mm. and I could only do a, a few minutes a day of this. Like I I just couldn't. I didn't have the stamina or the hand strength to do more, but I felt like an artist because I did what I could do. Right, 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 because you are still doing something. And I found this loads of times in my own life and also working with clients, just just a small thing every day that you do for yourself. can, Because then that's today's today that I lived or I I, I got something too. Mm, yes. And it you know, it doesn't need to be as much as the energy and attention you're giving to the child, but for it to have a, a big effect. Yeah. Um, and one thing actually I'm finding out this year is that you reminded me of, this isn't in relation to childcare directly, but I recommitted to having a, a notebook. So I've got a nice notebook and I've just been making sure I just carry it with me into the room that I'm in when I'm working or doing stuff around the house and the the amount of just little ideas that I because the notebook's there, I'm just jotting it down, and I'm making a note, and and then I'm going back to and I know where to to find that now, and I'm capturing so much that you know when I it is time to say write that idea up, that article or that podcast episode or, or whatever, I go and open the notebook and it, there's gold dust in there. There's all these little nuggets of stuff that I've captured yeah, in just odd little moments. And it is, um, it's a way of just, of just thinking, but capturing the thinking. Yeah. So that's, I'm not in a particularly time cramped situation from external circumstances, but I could imagine if I were, you know, say I'm traveling or indeed had small children again, I think just the sense that I was capturing something that would be a seed for something in the future, I think I find really, uh, I can get a surprising amount in, in those little, tiny little moments in the day. I, I love that you say that. And it's making me, it's making me remember, um, I've heard of someone, I've not met this person or worked with this person, but I've heard of someone who wrote a book um, in five minute snatches, you know, with one hand because their other hand, so they've got the phone in one hand, they're dictating into their phone. The other hand is holding their baby's head as their baby is nursing. Like th there's, we, it's, it's about us. If we can kind of overcome that resistance and say, no, this is worth it. Like this minute, this, this few moments, I'm going to do this. And I, so much of it, is about giving ourselves permission. I mean, so much of it is about saying like, this is, even if nothing ever comes of it, it's a worthwhile mm. thing to do because I, because it feels good and right in this moment. And it feels, it's making me feel like a creator. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's where you were Towards the end of 2019, you were you developed a really great way of of teaching and helping parents, like so many of us as coaches and teachers, you were helping them with the thing that you had struggled with. That's certainly mm. been a theme for my career. Um, <laughs> and then what happened is, you know, when, when did you first become aware that this COVID thing was going to be serious and was going to have an impact on your work and and on the lives of all these these parents that you were helping. Oh, wow. So I remember it so vividly. Um, I live about, I don't know, a couple thousand miles away from my parents. They're in the Colorado Rockies. And mm. on March, I think it was March 18th, uh, I was visiting them with my son. With my At the time, he was 15, I think. And we didn't know if we were going to be able to come home. I mean, we didn't, everything was shutting down. Um it was it was such a scary and terrifying time, and I had just been given, um, I'd just been invited to give an endorsement for a friend's um, book that she had written. It's called Coping Skills for Teens. It's by this a very good friend of mine named Janine Halloran. She's an amazing, amazing woman. Um, she's a licensed uh, mental health counselor, and mm -hmm. uh, she's so I'm reading this book about coping skills for teens, and I'm out there in Colorado with my teen. And we are both just beside ourselves with 
fear and anxiety and and not knowing what's I mean physically we felt safe we you know we yeah. weren't I, I know people who've been in so much much worse situations in the pandemic but we just felt so grateful to be able to come home I can remember getting off the plane and getting the news that the governor of Colorado had just announced that if you are coming from Colorado you must quarantine for 14 days and we're in the car with my husband and so now does that mean he needs to quarantine for 14 days and right. like our our older son was uh was not living at home at that point. He was, um, but what he, so I couldn't see him. I couldn't hug him. I couldn't, right. He would, he would bring us groceries and put them at one end of the garage and we'd go into the other end and wave and, mm-hmm. and say thank you. And it was just terrifying. And what, one of the things, one of the first things that I did was I put together a little online free virtual summit called OKCon 2020. Mm-hmm. And in, in the doing of that, I got to talk to so many parenting experts that I had co- that had come on my show that that had become friends, and I think I I think I did like ten interviews in like ten days, and every time I did an interview, oh. I would feel so good because here was someone else experiencing what I yeah. was experiencing. Here's them giving their best advice on on handling money right now, on finding a job, on. God, I mean, you you name it. Like, it was amazing. Yeah. And um, that was so helpful. And I realized that, like, there are some themes here. One of the themes is even if we're stuck at home, we don't have to be isolated. We don't have to be any more isolated than we want to be as long as we've got, you know, a, a, a phone or a, a, mm-hmm. a, a something like that. Um, and every time I took steps to help somebody else, I felt better. So that really was a theme, I would say, through most of the pandemic. Um, what happened after 10 or so months of that was I got diverticulitis again, which I hadn't had in like nine and a half years mm-hmm. because I had been so busy filling everybody else's cup that I completely right. left my own health in the dust. So uh, the pandemic was has been a really interesting kind of like crucible for self-care. So what, what did you learn from that? Uh, I were, I have this memory of lying in the hospital and saying, cause you're not, you're not having visitors. No one's visiting you in COVID, right? Like it was such a tense time, but I do, I felt very cared for and I was starting to feel better. And I remember lying there and saying, you've got to close your community. Like you can't do this anymore. You, you've got to come first or else you're going to die. Like, and I remember having these very, very stark feelings and then thinking like, but how can I do that? I'll be letting them down. I, 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 I don't know how to do that. And when I brought that to them, once, once I was, you know, on the mend, they were so gracious and wonderful. And they, and they said things like, thank you for being a good example of taking care of yourself. And I 100% respect your decision. And, um, that was where I started to think, like, I've got to approach this differently, or I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna make it through the pandemic. <laughs> mm. And before we get on to how you then approach that differently, could you say something about the kind of issues that you were seeing from parents? You know, as the pandemic first of all hit, and then it became apparent that this wasn't going to be over within a, a few weeks. We, we yeah. were kind of in it for the long haul. What, what kind of issues were you hearing about? Yeah, and. Um, I'm, I really appreciate this question. Um, they were going through basically what I was going through, right? Which is everyone is pouring from an empty cup. No one knows what's going to happen next. So how do we, what do we do? We have, this is information. Like if we can try and take it out of the realm of like panicking and, and instead see it as like, okay, this is actually the facts on the ground. This is what is happening. Um, a lot of it became about, um, it was really focused on, I would say two things. One is, uh, helping our kids and helping, or I was, you know, helping them name emotions instead of sort of trying to push them away because people were feeling so much more emotions. I mean, and that, that, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily true. It's just that suddenly, the zeitgeist was just full of rage and fear and like you couldn't yeah. get away from it unless you could recognize that and 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 recognizing any emotion is the first step towards being able to kind of move beyond it like mm-hmm. 
So, so part of it was that, and part of it was, I mean, a real sense of like time management. Often I find with clients that they're super stressed out. They're working many hours. Uh, I, I work with folks who, some of them are single parents, which makes things even more complicated. Um, and they just, they have young children, for example, and, and young children need <laughs> stimulation and activity. And it can be so incredibly difficult for, for them. So if someone needs to be isolated on a conference call or, or even just spend that time working, right? Like, uh, and and if they're if they're in a situation where they've got they're al- alone at home with a with a little with a with a young child especially but this can be on up into into older children as well, um, it can feel really hard and and awful and and parents can just not know what to do and something that I have found that's worked really really well with clients well I suppose the first thing that I've found that's worked really really well is for someone to give themselves permission to say, you know what, there is something I can do about this. I, maybe I don't know what it is yet, but to, to be able to ask the question, what can I do instead of sort of shutting down and, and you know, being stressed. And something that's worked really, really well is um, a simple, this sounds so simple, a simple timer where um, you might, for example, have a timer that you set for, and, and there's a little bit of lead up, like you don't want to do this on the five minutes before your, your big meeting or your <laughs> conference call or whatever. Right. Um, so to be able to, to set it, set that timer for three minutes, just as an example, and to say to your child, I'm going to, mama's going to work. I, I, I say mama, it can of course be uh, mom or dad, mm-hmm. right. I'm going to go off uh, and do my work. And while I'm doing that, uh, you get to be out here and you get to play with the trains or you get to, you know, you get to play, stay out here and when the timer goes off, I'm going to come back and we're going to play together. And so then you are spending some time playing with your child when that timer goes off. So they're feeling that bond. And you are starting to establish kind of a boundary. And the beautiful thing is that you can expand that, right? Like, so so um, I've worked with people who've, with with very young children, very energetic children who have been able to expand to like, maybe it's 30 minutes when that timer goes off. And and they can come out and reconnect and have a lovely bonding five minutes with their child and then back they go for for half an hour. And in the meantime, their child is exploring their world in ways that are safe and not plunked in front of the television. <laughs> so and I, I'm hearing a theme that I know from from listening to your podcast and other conversations with you that I think really key to your approach, as as I understand it, is just looking for that chink of possibility and saying, look, there is something in here that can be done, however small, and that yeah. thing can then grow. Yes. Okay, so Kara, I'd like to pick up on the thread from a bit earlier on where you talked about, for you, homeschooling was a decision that you took quite a long time ago as a as a positive decision, as something you you really wanted to do, that you felt it was yeah. a better option than was available um, in the usual schooling system, but as we as we said, a lot of us have have been through the process of, of involuntary homeschooling over the last couple yes. of years in various various versions and phases of lockdown. So, what have you been sharing with with parents who who thought I would never have to do this? I, I thought that the school would take care of all of this, and now now it's devolved onto me. What kind of advice have you been giving them? Yeah. I mean, I've worked with people who who are like, I never wanted this. I never wanted this. <laughs> like yeah. I was, I want, I love my child, but I, I, this is the, not a responsibility that I signed up for. And okay. I think part the really the first part of it is working through those feelings because we can have those feelings and then we can feel so guilty because we have them, you know? Um, and I think... Uh, sort of being able to say like, again, okay, taking emotion out of it, these are the facts on the ground. How can we make this work for us? And I mean, God, I've, I've known parents who, um, who, who got a lot out of sitting right next to their child, um, who, who, and, and, you know, so they're coloring while their child is doing social studies or whatever. And, and it really worked for both of them. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then other parents who, and I, I wanted to say too, like 
my work started out to be with sort of preschoolers and very, very young children. But as I've, I used to say my license ended at uh, third grade or age nine. And I was like, okay, I've now got a 10-year-old child. Like, what do I do here? <laughs> right. <laughs> and so um, what what I've noticed is that they're still the same child. Like, we don't suddenly get another kid when they're an adolescent. There's changes, of course, but um, they're still the same kid, right? So, and, but they have different needs. Um, so, for example, I remember working with one woman who um, gave her daughter, who, who said to her daughter, who was really struggling with the online schooling, she said to her daughter, you know what? You can have the video. I'm going to write to your teacher and say that if you want the video off, you can have it off. And then her daughter was able to learn while building like dollhouse structures, like out of mm-hmm. cardboard, out of paint, out of, you know, she yeah. would build these beautiful things and she would still know the lesson. Mm-hmm. She would still be able to, like that helped her take it in in, in a way that w- worked better for her. Mm-hmm. Um I think I'm going to always suggest, and I have always suggested that like working with a teacher, if you can, like don't, we, we, we can in a very, coming from a very cynical place, I think cynicism is a real symptom of burnout and there's so much burnout in this, but if we can kind of get beyond that cynical place and say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to my teacher about this. I'm going to talk to my child's teacher about this. Like this is something that needs to be addressed Um, I've worked through that with so many parents of like, but they're saying this, well, was it a person who said that? Or was it a newsletter? Like, how is this coming to you? Can, can something be individualized? Yeah, exactly. Um, so many, and I I think everything comes back to uh, the emotions and the, the social, the socio emotional piece of our children is, is overarching. And there can't be my, this is my opinion. There can't be any learning until that is addressed. And so when we get into like adolescence, we get into older kids. I mean, these are high schoolers have had it. I, in my opinion, again, worse than anyone because like things are already hard when you're 15, 16, 17. Right. But it's so much harder when you can't like I, my memories of being that age are like sitting on a sofa with six other friends and singing our guts out together and like just laughing and, they mm-hmm. can't do that now. And, and, and how do you keep going when, when you can't, you know what I mean? And, and, uh, wh- as they get older, I feel like it's a lot more about saying to them, like, what do you need here? Like, how can I be a support for you? Cause we can, we think we know what they want or need. And oftentimes we do, but if we say it that way to them, you need this, they don't hear that. Right. Okay. So I've been, you know, we've been focused, if you like, on on the really kind of hard end of, of things, like lock, homeschooling during lockdown and managing the calendar so you can actually get your work done. But mm. j- just looking at thinking about the the impact of the pandemic more broadly, and maybe even opening the door to some positive possibilities mm. and options that have coming. What what kind of trends are you seeing among the parents that you talk to, and what kind oh. of things do you? I guess. Where I'm coming from is my wish when all of this started was, I hope we all come out of this with more choices than we went in. So I'd love to hear about any choices that you're seeing that parents now have that maybe they didn't feel they had before. Oh, I love this. And it it really is reflective of where I am in my in my creative life and my professional life, as well as the people that I work with and what what they're seeing in their lives. And that is, I would say, they now know that they can choose. There is, there's, I think in, in a lot of us, um, there's been a sort of, uh, a dormant, I, a coaching friend of mine has said it, that there's a dormant, don't fuck with me inside of us. Mm-hmm. And, um, that has come out now, yeah. right? Like yeah, yeah. we are the people I'm working with. And, and again, even for myself, like you don't get to mess with me. I, I'm the one who gets to decide. You don't get to decide for myself or my children. And and I, I do see that as an incredible positive because what's happening is we are ordering our lives the way that we want them. Okay, so Kay, can I pick up on another thread from earlier on, which was when you, you talked about on your own journey, you talked about that big decision to close your community. Mm, what did yeah. you then move into doing? What was the next phase of your work about? Yes. One, so one-on-one coaching is, is what I do. One, one-to-one. Um, that's 
that's really the only way that I work. Although I have, um, I have a, a newsletter, uh, you know, a group of subscribers to, mm-hmm. to my newsletter. And, um, I, I write to them each week and, um, I share a piece of art more or less every week that I've been working on a story behind it. Something that has like your poetry podcast came up on, you know, in my newsletter. Yeah, that's um, pretty nice of you. Thank you. Oh, uh, that, well, it was, it was very, it really fit in with something that I had been, you helped me work through something that I had been thinking about. So I, it's, a, it's such a great show. Um, I share each month, I share, uh, one month of my uh, playbook of days mm-hmm. so that people can t- print it and enjoy it and like use it. Right. Um, I go, uh, we have a once a month complimentary meetup where like anybody in the newsletter gets the, everyone in the newsletter gets this link. Um, and you can come and spend an hour together. And like this, this past month, what we did was we talked about our, uh, our word of the year for 2022. Like, um, so I'm sharing, I'm, I'm in community in that way. It's not that yeah. I've completely isolated myself, but but what I love to do is be in conversation with people. And so the one-to-one coaching has become a much bigger part of my life. Um, and it's a ball. I love it. <laughs> and are you working mainly with parents these days? You know, I am actually, as it turns out. Yeah. Um, I like to think that what I, what we do is, is we work on the inner lives of parents and, um, so very often, very often it's a transition. It's a transition time for them. So, uh, you know, um, at least one client I'm working with right now, like they've just become an empty nester. So what is that like? And what do they do now? Um, but others it's, it's, it's more about, and it's sometimes, you know, t- sometimes temper tantrums come up as they come up in our lives. Right. But very often what we talk about is like, what's going on with them inside? How are they feeling? What are they doing? And what, what could make it better? Do you know what I, do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's building their future. And I think the byproduct of that, that we've seen is that they're now an amazing role model for their kids. Right. I mean, this is another reason really for, for not, not giving everything in inverted commas to the kid, because what are you teaching them about what it's like to be a parent? What, what yeah. will they internalize and grow up with? And, um, you know, you're setting them up for a lot of guilt and pressure. But I love this phrase, the inner life of parents, because, you know, you think about all the, the books on parenting and the advice. Un- understandably, there's an awful lot of outer focus stuff because that's by definition a parent is, is out of focus. There's a lot of hands-on practical skills to be learned. Yeah. I love that phrase, though, that, that the inner life of parents is something that could be neglected and, uh, yeah. and often is. So it's great that you're there nurturing it. Yeah, oh, I appreciate that. So, Kay, I think this would be a good time for your creative challenge. So if you are listening to the show and this is the first time, then this is the point of the interview where I ask my guest to set you, the listener, a creative challenge, which is something that will stretch you creatively and probably as a person as well. And it's something that you can do or at least get started on within seven days of listening to the interview. And it obviously will be on the theme of the interview. So, Kay, what is your creative challenge? I So I just want to say how excited I am to be able to be the setter of the challenge. I've done so many of these challenges, Mark, over the years. And, and like this feels really, really exciting. So when I reflected, really what I came up with was something that was a huge challenge for me, but that has been such a game changer for me. And I, and I would like to invite our listeners to give it a try. And it is this, uh, as a part of your bedtime routine for the next seven, seven nights, this is within a week, each of the next seven nights, take a few moments to look at yourself in the mirror. Uh, Smile if you can. I know sometimes we don't feel like smiling at ourselves, but if you can, that's that's a part of this. And just take a few moments to kind of talk to yourself and out loud, audibly, tell yourself good things that happened today. Tell yourself about the things that were a joy in your day or the things that if you can't find any joys, because sometimes it's that, you know, give yourself a little hug in the mirror and just tell yourself like, that, that good things are ahead 
and in that you can access them and that they are here for you. Uh, and I like to end, and I would invite you to end each night by saying, good night, I love you, and I'll talk to you tomorrow night. Mm-hmm. And as I say, do it for seven nights. And if if it feels good, keep doing it. Mm-hmm. I think I started seven nights like five years ago, and it felt so weird. But, but you know, and I used to say to my kids, like, you guys, you're going to hear me probably talking to myself in the mirror. and um, it, it's, it's one of the best things that I have done in, in the tough times. It's been a, a comfort and in the good times, it's been a fun way to celebrate. So great. Thank you, Kay. That's a lovely challenge. You're welcome. I, I would really love to hear, um, from those of you who try it, I'd really love to hear your experience with it. Great. So where should people go, Kay, to, learn more about you and your approach. And if, if they're at a point where they're looking for some help, maybe get in touch and ask you for some help. Well, thank you for asking. Um, I am very excited. I've I've just started a, a new website. I've just moved from uh, my old one to this new one. It is klockkolp.com, mm-hmm. K-A-Y-L-O-C-K, K O L P <laughs> dot com. Okay. And um, <clears throat> there is a, there's a contact page there. Um, where I would love to hear from 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 folks, um, and there's also kloccolp.com/slash weekly mm-hmm. is where uh, if somebody wants to subscribe to my newsletter, um, that is where they can that is where they can do that. I'm also I'm just remembering, Mark. There's one more aspect of this that I think is really important to highlight. If it's okay, oh, um, so it's part of the inner life of a parent, I think maybe one of the coolest parts is the idea of being present instead of worrying about the future or regretting the past, but being here in this moment. And what's very, very fun about that is, uh, it can, we can, we can do that for ourselves, be present for ourselves. We can also do it with our kids. And then like that, to me, that's where the fun really starts. Mm -hmm. When, when you are, when you are present, fully present with your child, uh, when you, when you can, be silly with them and listen for their questions and uh, just be with them. It's that's when things are the best. So uh, at least that's how I feel. (laughs) Well, that feels like a lovely place to, to end the conversation today. So here's to more moments of, of joyful presence, presence, joyful or otherwise with, with kids. So thank you very much, Kay. It's, you know, like I say, this has been a really, requested topic on the podcast and i'm so glad that we could get you to with the expertise that i don't have in this area i'm a keen amateur when it comes to parenting um so it's (laughs) been really great to get your more informed and professional perspective on it so thank you very much you're welcome i appreciate it thank you so much You have been listening to The 21st Century Creative, hosted by Mark McGuinness. You can find the notes for today's episode with more about my guest, as well as all the backlist episodes at 21stCenturyCreative.fm. If you enjoyed the show, then I hope you will subscribe in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, and take a few seconds to swipe and leave a rating for the show. If you would like to take the 21st Century Creative Foundation course to help you carve out an original creative career, you can sign up and get the whole course for free at 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash free course. And if you are an experienced creative and you're curious about getting my help as a private coaching client, then the first step is to go to 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash coaching questions and answer the questions on that page. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll join me again soon.